slipping, slipping, slipping. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Grace this morning. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here. I hope that you are too. Uh, we're in the what third week of our summer series. Time keeps on slipping. And uh, we're focusing on time and the value of time and how to spend our time wisely. And if you were here last week, then you heard Pastor Dennis's message and you know that he ran out of time. And so when Tom was up mid-sentence, he just walked off and the worship team walked out and it was over because he ran out of time. So if if you missed that, you should go back and watch it. kind of awkward actually but but uh and as you see he's not up here this morning and I'm not picking up where he left off he was out of time and so we're starting a whole new message this morning Um, but I'd like to pray before we get started and then we'll be turning to Psalms so Heavenly Father Lord I just thank you for this opportunity Lord to speak your word this morning I pray that you will calm my nerves and that you will just fill me with your spirit, Lord, that it will be your voice that's heard this morning, Lord, and uh, that you will open the hearts and the minds of everyone that's here today, Lord, and that we will hear what you have to say to us, that it will be your voice that's heard. And we love you and we praise you and we give you the honor and the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to start in Psalm 127.4, and if you have your outline, it's in your outline. But um, this is Solomon talking, and I love the way that Solomon tells things. He's very good with analogies. He can make you visualize something. And um, in, I know that normally we think of David writing psalms, and, and he didn't write most of them, but this one Solomon wrote. And in, in Psalms 127.4, he says, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. And so when Solomon wanted to give us uh, the idea of what parenting is like, when he wanted to give us that image, he gives us the image of archery. And so all of a sudden, because we know archery, right? Like we've seen Lord of the Rings and Hunger Games, right? So, so, so all of a sudden now we got our Katniss Everdeen on and, and when we get that warrior vibe and all of our living rooms are turned into an archery range and our children are arrows and, and our moms and dads are now master archers and, and we get that warrior vibe going, right? We, we get in the spirit of it. And at the center of it all is this target. And it's that that I'd like to talk about today is that target, what we're aiming at. And if you're not a parent uh, or if you've already raised your children or your grandchildren, this message is for you too because we are all children of God. And if you are further along in your spiritual journey than someone else, then you can come alongside them like a spiritual mother or father and help to guide them and help to, to lead them and uh, to be an example to them. So this message is for everyone this morning. I want you to look at it from that perspective. Um, I've asked Rio to come and help me this morning. Many of you know our oldest daughter, Rio. What you may not know about Rio is that she is a great archer. And so if I have never gotten the chance to brag about this to you, I will do it today. Uh, she's on the archery team at Stone Elementary, and it, you may have read it in the paper that they got third place in the state of Tennessee. So they're the third highest archery team in the state of Tennessee, and they advanced to nationals last month where they qualified to go to world next month. So we'll be headed to Orlando, Florida next month, and uh, we're really, really proud of them. And actually, Pleasant Hill qualified for world as well. So our county is really representing this year. Last year, Stone made it to uh, world, and they, they made it to nationals and to world, and they were the first team in our county to ever make it to nationals, much less world. And so we're proud to, to have made that history. Uh, and she did, she did really well there, and it was in Myrtle Beach. And it is interesting, they, at the beginning of each day, they honor God and country. And so they say a prayer uh, to our God and only to our God. And then they play that national anthem for each country that's 
that's shooting that day. So they played the American, you know, they played our national anthem, and we all stood there with our hands over our hearts, and then they played the Mongolian national anthem, and we all stood there with our hands over our hearts. And Mr. Mullins was like, no, 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 that's only, that's only for us. And we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, we were just being respectful, right? Because we were doing it too, weren't we? <laughs> we didn't know. But anyway, um, so I've asked Rio to show us a little bit about of what she's got this morning. And we're going to learn a little bit about archery and a lot about life this morning. So if you don't know anything about archery, you might want to take some notes because this might be some stuff that you can use later. Um, but the first thing that you need to know about archery is that an archer is not an archer without a target. So that's where her daddy comes in. Rog, will you bring us a target out, please? And I'll, I'll move out of the way. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 We need a target. <laughs> I've taught her to never shoot at her father. <laughs> All right, you ready, Rio? Okay, she's going to shoot three arrows. Nice. See, I told you she was good. Yeah, it is impressive. She's really good. See, I'll turn it around here where y'all can see it. Okay. She's good. She's good. Much better than Teresa Daniels would be. Because I have to tell you what Teresa Daniels did. Now, now Teresa... <laughs> was the one up here leading worship this morning. And I walked in this morning with my arrows, and she looked at me and said, going fishing? <laughs> I said, you're going to learn a lot today, Teresa. <laughs> you're welcome. We'll be talking about this for years. <laughs> but anyway, just like Solomon related parenting, to archery, I'm going, I'm going to relate archery to life. So this is the, the verse that Solomon said, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. So in the archery game of life, you must, number one, focus on the target. Focus on the target. So we have many arrows, but we only have one target. Okay, many arrows, one target. That's important. I'll come back to the arrows in just a minute. But we need to figure out first, what is the target? What is the goal in life? What, what is the focus? And so I think we should turn to the Bible for that. Matthew 6, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So put that on your target. That's what our focus should be, seeking God first and his righteousness. So, Mom and Dad, if you're looking for what you should, what the goal and the mission of your household should be, this is it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Uh, because there is no, there's nothing more important than leading our children to Christ. There's nothing more important than seeing our children seek God in this life and that when this life is over, that they will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. There's nothing more important than that in life. Proverbs says that he who wins souls is wise. Our goal is to win souls for Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And we start first in our home, in our household, 
and then in our community, and then in our world, but first in our household. It should be, it should be our purpose to evangelize those little hearts towards Jesus. And if we fail to seek to do that, then no matter what else we accomplish in life, we fail. Now, I didn't say if we fail to do that because our children have minds of their own and they have free will and they have their own choices to make. But I'm saying if we fail to try to do that, if we fail to seek to lead them to Jesus, then we fail. No matter what else we succeed at, we fail. So that should be our main goal in life. Joshua 20, oh, sorry. You have a target on your outline. If you have decided or you're deciding today that God is going to be the center of your target, the focus of your target, then I'd like you to write God across that target on your outline. Just declare that today between you and him by writing that on your target. Sorry, I'm skipping. Joshua 24, 15 says, For as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've got to know that. You've got to consciously make that decision that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because the world and the people in it, they will try to convince you otherwise. They will try to, try to distract you otherwise. And they will, they will pressure you to, to take your aim and to spend your, your time and your money on other things. So you got to get real good at saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've got to set that standard. You've got to, you've got to say, our eyes are fixated and focused on God. Our, our bullseye is heaven. That's our main focus. So, so get that bullseye and write God across it and make sure that that's your focus. Number two is you have to aim your arrows. Because let me tell you, that verse, as for me and my house, that's going to be answered either way. You, know, you can answer it with, we will serve the Lord, or you can answer it otherwise. You, know, you can say, me and my house, we will play soccer. Me and my house, we will, we will make straight A's. Or me and my house, we are going to retire early. Or we're going to attend an Ivy League college. Or whatever it may be, there's something that's a highest priority in your life. And so the thing is that there's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with soccer. And there's nothing wrong with, with archery. And there's nothing wrong with retiring early or getting a good education. There's nothing wrong with those things. But when they become more important than God then you have an idol in God's throne and they become God and that's a problem and so that's what we're talking about today is is getting that that focus right because remember there are many arrows there are many arrows in our lives and I want you to think about arrows like remember in school when you talked about nouns think about arrows as the person's places and things of your life. And so your arrows that are important in your life, maybe your children, your job, could be soccer, could be gymnastics, uh, basketball, whatever it may be. We have to focus on aiming these arrows. So we have some arrows on your outline this morning, and I'd like you to write on those arrows what those important things are in your life, what your arrows are. And... <clears throat> We're going to talk about how to aim those. Because if one of those is your job, then think about how can I aim that arrow towards God? You know, maybe you need to represent him better at work. Maybe you need to watch your language. Maybe you need to produce a better quality of work. Or, um, you know, maybe it's in the way that you treat your coworkers or your employees. How can you glorify God in your job? How can you glorify God, lead your children to God? You know, because like all these things, 
that are important to you, soccer, archery, piano, all those things, they get to be an arrow. They don't get to be the target, but they get to be an arrow. And God has gifted you or your children with talents and abilities. Not so that those talents and abilities can become your God, but so that you can use those talents and abilities to point people towards God. He's giving you those opportunities. So if you're a great basketball player, how can you use that basketball on the court to lead people to God? How can you be that godly example that draws people to him? Everything in our life should center around this target, should be aimed at that target. So we have lots of arrows and only one target. And it's all about the focus. It's all about what we're putting first. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the, it's called the 4 to 14 window. Um, I spent over 14 years in, in youth ministry here at Grace. And I cannot tell you how important it is to have your children in church. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning because you're all here and your children are in church. And so uh, I'm very thankful for that. But I can't tell you how important it is to do that consistently. Not because you're going to bring them to church and our youth department and our children's department is going to teach them everything they need to know about God. That's not the reason you're bringing them to church, believe it or not, because that, that responsibility falls more on you as a parent than it does on these people who see them once a week or twice a week. But it's important that you bring them to church because they're going to make friends with people who have the same beliefs as them, that are, that are sitting under the same teaching as them, that can support them. And they're also connecting with other adults who can be a guide for them, who can be a confidant, you know, that they can talk to you about things other than you because most of you know that eventually you know nothing at all. And they need somebody that's smart in their life, right? And so <laughs> that's where Jeff and Jessica and Sarah and Sam and Lucas and, and Brooke, that's where they come in. And they can be the smart ones and they can help them. And so it's, it's really important to have them in church each week because the 4 to 14 window is, is a theory that I believe is true that from the ages of 4 to 14, people are more open to hearing about God. They're more open to learning about God. That's when they're learning about their world, they're learning about God, they're learning about love, and they're more open to that. And if you reach them between the ages of 4 and 14, they are likely to follow God the rest of their lives. But if you reach them, if you try to reach them after that, it's much, much more difficult. Now, they can still be reached, but it's much, much more difficult. And so the thing is, is that the world keeps us so busy that between these ages of 4 and 14, we are so busy focusing them on this target over here, on all these other things. And then when they get older, we expect them to land back over here. But how's that happen? How's that going to happen? It's not. It's not. And so we've, we, we've got to reach them when they're impressionable because did you know that what is rooted in the heart of a child is almost impossible to uproot in the heart of an adult. And you all have probably experienced this very much in your own lives. What's rooted in the heart of a child is nearly impossible to uproot in the heart of an adult. So let's let that be God. Let's let that be God that's rooted in their little hearts. So I think that we need to amend our flight plan. We need to amend our plan and instead of saying, we will play soccer, and we will play basketball or whatever it may be. And if, if there's some extra time, you know, we'll add God in on the side. Let's say no. Let's say no. God is the most important thing in our lives. God is number one. He is the one that is worthy of our praise and most, the most of our attention. He deserves it. And we're going to give it to him. And all these other things will be added unto us. Because no one sits on their deathbed and wishes that they played more ball. They don't. But there's plenty of people that sit on their deathbed and wish that they had given God the attention and the high place of honor that he deserved in this life. Because, you know, when kids are young, 
Y'all have heard this, right? When kids are young, they do what you tell them. And when they grow up, they do what you showed them. So what are you showing them? Are you showing them that God is the highest priority? Because everything I say and everything I do tells a story of who I follow. Tells a story of who my God is. You know, my kids have never asked me, never asked me, are we going to church? They've never asked me that question. And I, I get it. I Believe me, I get it. We're busy. You know, I have two kids. We're busy. We're running here and there. Uh, if, you, if you watched my schedule, you would know. I'm, I'm passing myself on the street. I know we're busy. I know, parents, that you need a break. But listen, they, they've, they've, they've got to be in church. Because I know that it's easy for them to miss church. I know that's the easiest thing for them to miss. Because, you know, if, they, if little Timmy misses wrestling practice this week, or little Sue misses piano practice this week, it's probably going to be evident next week in their performance that they miss practice. I get that. And if they miss church this week, it's not going to be that evident next week that they missed. The effects are not going to be seen that quickly. But they will be seen eventually. They will be seen. I promise you, they need to be in church. But like I said, my kids never asked me. They've never said, you know, are we, are we going to church tomorrow or are we going to sleep late? Never asked me that. They've never said, are we going to go to church today or are we going to find something better to do? They've never asked me that. And I know you say, well, that's easy for you to say. You work here. Of course you're going to be here. You know, you're on staff at the church. Of course you're going to be here. No, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian and you are my team. And this is where our team meets. And this is where our, our, our coach stands up here and he pumps us up and we yell, go team. And we go out there and we reach other people and bring them into our team. First day of the week, we meet with our team. And you know what the great thing about a team is? It's that when you need them, they're there. Through the good times and the bad times, you got people that care about you, and they're there. So if something happens, you don't have to grab a phone book and flip through the phone book and be like, well, it'd be nice to have a church right now. No. You've already prepared for the battle that you're not yet in. Which brings me to our next point. Just take a stance. You got to take a stance. Did y'all notice Rio's stance? She has a really good stance. Mr. Mullins used to use her as an example of a good stance. And then a couple of months ago, she, she kind of lost her stance a little bit. And she got in there and she practiced and she worked hard and she got it back just in time for uh, nationals. And she scored high at nationals and, and really helped her team. If, uh, if, you, if you don't know about archery, they, shoot, they actually shoot 30 arrows in a tournament. And so a perfect score would be 300, just like in bowling, a perfect score would be 300. And at national, she shot a 266, and at world, she shot a 270. Right? Last year, she shot 270 at world. She shot 266 at nationals this year. So she's, she's a really good shot. She's a real benefit to her team. Um, I told them in first service that she shot higher than that because I like to exaggerate sometimes, but I don't need to exaggerate because she did good. She did real good. Uh, but it's important to take a stance. This, if, if you noticed how she stood, she stood with her feet shoulder width apart, you know, good, solid foundation. And when she pulled her string back, she anchored it at her mouth. So good foundation, string anchored. And I love that. I love that because the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 19, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So if you're anchored in the word of God, so how, how do we do that? How do we anchor ourselves in the word of God? Paul said to the Thessalonians, he, he was writing this to the church in Thessalonica, uh, Greece, to the Christians in the church. And he wrote, with all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip 
on the teaching that we passed on to you both in person and by letter. And so by letter, he's talking about the letter that he's writing to them right now. And he, you know, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and that was generally letters that he was writing to the different churches in, in the surrounding areas. And so he was saying, you know, to stand firm in that teaching that he gave them in person and in writing. So where do we get that today? Where do we get that teaching in person? We get it here. We get it in the church. And in writing, we get it by reading our Bibles. And so uh, I know Sam talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but it is really important to read your Bible. It's really important. And so if you are new at that, you, you need to do that because coming here on Sunday morning and hearing what Pastor Dennis tells you about when he read his Bible is not all there is to it. You, know, you need to be digging into God's Word daily. And so if you are new at reading your Bible, then I would just encourage you to, to just do it, to just open it up and do it. You don't, have to, you don't have to read a whole chapter. You don't have to, you know, read the entire Bible through in a year. You don't even have to start at the beginning. I used to think that, that you had to start at the beginning. And so I can't tell you how many times I read the book of Genesis because I would start and then I quit. And then a few months later, I'd start again. And then I quit a few months later. And over and over, I read the book of Genesis. I didn't even know what the rest of the book said. So it's important to read it, but you don't, there's no right or wrong way. You just open it up and read it. You don't even have to start at the beginning of a book. Just read it. If you're reading it, it's right. And so I hear a lot of people say, well, I, I don't read it. It's too hard. I can't, I don't know the pronunciations. And, and so I, I can't read those words. And I would say to you, read it anyway. It doesn't matter if you pronounce the words right. You know, tomato, tomato. New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, whatever, you know. We all pronounce things differently. We were talking in our, uh, <laughs> we were talking in our walking group couple weeks ago and if y'all want to get in our walking group we meet on Wednesday nights at 6 15 at the Obed River Park but we were talking in our group about how to pronounce the word the word a-u-n-t and uh, I think it was I think it was Lisa said aunt and honey said aunt and I said ain't <laughs> I'm born and raised here and I said ain't and uh, they looked Honey especially looked at me like I was a little odd, but I'm think, I'm like, I have an aunt, Margie and Aunt, Polly and Aunt Louise, Aunt Sharon, I got lots of aunts, they answer to it. So it's all right, right? <laughs> I don't see the problem in it. So it's okay if you pronounce things wrong. Don't don't let that keep you from reading your Bible. And if you have a phone, you can go to you can download this app, the Bible app, or you can go on your computer to Bible.com. And you can use that program, which is so great. It's free. It's all free, so there's no reason to not get it. And there's thousands and thousands of devotions on there. Um, there's devotions on parenting. There's devotions on, on marriage and grief and depression. and just Anything that you can think of, any age, any stage that you are in life, there's a devotion on there that you could do. And then there's also... Uh, all the different versions of the Bible, so you can go on there and pick whichever version that you like and whichever version that's easiest for you to understand. And you read that, and there's even a button that you can push, and it'll read it to you. So gone are the days when we say that we couldn't read our Bible because we didn't have a Bible with us, because we have our Bibles with us all the time, right? Um, we've got to anchor ourselves in God's Word. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's how we anchor ourselves. We hide his word in our heart by reading his word. That's how you stand firm against the attacks of Satan. Because one more thing about arrows is that arrows are a weapon, and this is war. This life is war. It is. And I, I hear, so often I hear people say, say, well, this world's so messed up, I don't want to bring children into this world. And as Christians, I dare you to flip that I dare you to flip that and say, 
you know, because this world is so messed up, I'm going to raise up children armed with the name of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to send them out there into this world, into that medical field, into that soccer field, into that school, and, I, and they are going to reach this dark world for Jesus. Let's do that. A very wise man said, when God sees that in this poor old world a wrong needs writing or truth needs preaching or a benefit needs inventing, he sends a baby into the world to do it. F.W. Borum said that. Jesus is proof of that. Right? Jesus is proof of that. And you guys, guys, I know that family time is important. Believe me, I know that family time is important. But if serving God and worshiping God is getting in the way of your family time, that's a problem. Because one of the other things that I hear people say all the time is, well, I can't come to church on Sunday because Sunday is my family time. And I say, well, you know what? Sunday is my family time too. It is. Every Sunday when I leave here, I go to my parents' house. And I spend time with my family every Sunday. And I was thinking about this on Mother's Day because we all met out at my parents' house on Mother's Day. And it was special because it was Mother's Day, but it wasn't unusual because we always meet at my parents' house. My brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, you know, even sometimes my aunts and uncles come out to my parents' house on Sunday afternoon and we share a meal and we talk we share about our weeks, we encourage each other, we laugh, we cry, and we just spend time together. And now sometimes there's somebody, you know, one or two that aren't there, but they know that that's the meeting place and that's where we're always at. Now I'll tell you, my parents, if we didn't go, if we didn't show up on Sunday, they would still love us. If we didn't call them, unless something was wrong, they'd still love us. But they would long for more. And that's how God is. If you don't come to church on Sunday morning, God will still love you. And if you don't ever talk to him in prayer, he will still love you. But he longs for more. He longs to see you gather in his house with his children and encourage each other. He longs for you to talk to him when you don't have anything big to talk about. Because God loves you and he longs for you. And you know, when I spend time and I focus on God and I make him my top priority, it makes me a better wife and it makes me a better mother. Because things that honor and glorify him by their very nature honor my family and make me a better family person. Seek ye first, and all these things will be added unto you. And finally, evaluate the round. Evaluate the round. At the end of each round in archery, Rio goes up to her target and she looks at her arrows and she pulls them out one by one and she evaluates where did that arrow land? Was I off target? Do I need to make some adjustments? Do I need to stay the same? She evaluates that after every round. So I would encourage you at the end of every day to evaluate your day. How did I do? with that job arrow. Did I get a bullseye with the job arrow, but I missed the target completely with my kids? Because the Greek definition of sin is missing the mark. So we need to evaluate how we did. Because she's gonna pull these arrows out, but she's gonna shoot these same arrows in the next round, just like you are. You're gonna shoot those same arrows tomorrow. You're gonna aim those same arrows tomorrow. So what adjustments do you need to make? And then you pull those arrows out and you start with a fresh target. A fresh target, a clean slate. And you start again tomorrow. 
His Lamentations 3.23 says, Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. So each morning, each day, we get a fresh new start. And I'm thankful for that. Aren't you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. I pray that you will help us to each go home and focus our lives towards you, Lord, that we will think about your message and that we will glorify you and honor you in everything that we say and everything that we do. Lord, give us that still small voice that tells us when we're, when we're shooting off target, Lord. Help us all improve our aim. Help us to be the vessels that you created us to be. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in this life. You deserve it.